Good evening, good morning, people of YouTube. This video is going to be directed towards health practitioners themselves, and it's regarding the subjective assessment or exam. As a physiotherapist, I want to show you a method that I use, and maybe you can too, on how to memorize and conduct an holistic and in-depth subjective exam on almost any individual and their condition, albeit within a short amount of time. A thorough and detailed subjective review is one of the single most important interactions that a clinician can have with their patient and or client. And it is required to obtain as much information as possible regarding their condition, especially within the first consultation or the initial assessment. They allow us to gather as much information as possible regarding the patient's condition, history, their body structure and function, their activity, their participation, environmental factors and personal factors that may be contributing to their disability and will definitely affect the efficacy of your treatment. So that is basically outlined within what we call the RCF, the International Classification of Function, Disability and Health. We use the RCF as a common language and framework for describing the level of function of a person within their unique environment. This addresses not only their biomedical problems, but also involves psychosocial and socioeconomic factors. Before we get to use this method, it is important to first establish the basic and standard medical information that you need from a patient. And it goes without saying that obtaining informed consent and introducing yourself adequately is of utmost importance. You need the patient's name and surname, date of birth and age, where they live, and their contact details, obviously. Then, in any order, we'll first need to establish some basic medical questions, such as present medical history. So what is the problem, when did it start, and how was it managed, if at all? Then, of course, past medical history, either related or unrelated to the condition. So, have you had any previous injuries, surgeries, operations, or hospital admissions? Then, of course, this ties in with medication. So is the patient taking any medication currently or chronically? So does the patient have any chronic conditions that they're managing medically? Or are they taking any pain medication, anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids, antidepressants, and perhaps even opioids? Then of course, investigations. So this means has the patient had any x-rays, blood work done, CT scan, anything of the sorts. Then of course to finish it off and what is so important as a first line practitioner is screening for any sinister pathology or red flags. Personally I use a abbreviation called DEARTHCO and this stands for a few things. So DEARTHCO spelt D-E-A-R-T-H-C-O. D standing for diabetes, E epilepsy, A arthritis this could be gout rheumatoid conditions even osteoarthritis and then a could also stand for asthma moving on to r is respiratory conditions such as copd t stands for thyroid h stands for heart problems hypertension hemophilia and perhaps even hiv c stands for cancer and o stands for osteoporosis and obesity with regards to obesity, we're really looking at any unexplained weight gain or weight loss, at least within the last six months, as this could be indicative of any serious or sinister pathology. All right, moving on to the meat. As a disclaimer, I only want to share this as a method that I occasionally use in practice. Everybody is individually unique and you should not use a checklist or method to substitute or replace your ability to listen clinically reason, build rapport, and perform alternative assessments that can seriously affect a person's individual concerns. With that being said, OG friends have to ask, how feasible are patients' full expectations? What? I said, OG friends have to ask, how feasible are a patient's full expectations? This is a mnemonic. It stands for Occupation, Grants, Family, Home, Transport, Activities, Hobbies, Function, ADLs, Pain, Feelings and Expectations. It is quite a lot, but 
This is the method that I use to memorize it. You can use anything you'd like to memorize it yourself. For example, obese girls fear hard training and hyperactive females attempt poor form exercise. Or, only grannies feed hungry toddlers and hungry felines and patronize fathers extensively. Anyway, each one of these points weigh differently depending on the person and their condition. You should elaborate more on certain topics if you feel that they are absolutely necessary regarding their condition and vice versa. And you can decide this for yourself. For example, you may need to weigh in more on home environment and function for those with neurological conditions. Or you may need to weigh in more on activities and pain for those with musculoskeletal conditions. You catch the drift. O stands for occupation. Everything to do with someone's occupation, this is the first point. Are you working, unemployed, studying, or a pensioner? What does it involve? What are the activities involved? What is your duty? What is required of you? Do you still work? Or how can we rehabilitate you to work again? G stands for grants. This has to do with any social grants or welfare. This could also involve subsidies, allowances, sponsorships, bursaries, donations, etc. Some examples of these in South Africa are child support grants, disability grant, older person grant, and care dependency grant. F is for family, and this could mean a few things. Firstly, family history. Is there any pathology within your family history that may be affecting what you're experiencing now? Any genetic factors that could, you know, be predisposing you to any potential disability or problems in the future. But also, who does the patient live with? Do they have children or is anybody dependent on them? Alternatively, do they depend on anyone else? Do they have a caregiver, wife, or anybody to assist them? And who is the breadwinner of the household? H for home, and this includes anything surrounding the patient's home environment. For low socioeconomic areas, do they have access to water and electricity? How far is the bathroom from their bedroom and are they able to access it? What is the terrain like in and outside their house? Is it flat or maybe uneven or even slippery? Are there any steps or stairs that they may need to climb to even access their house? This can obviously affect your functional goals, especially for patients that are low functioning. T stands for transport and simply, how did they get here? Did they have to use public transport? If so, how far do they have to walk or travel to access the public transport? And was it even accessible? For example, for those using a walking frame or a wheelchair. Did they walk and how far did they have to walk? Or did they use private transport? Is somebody able to give them a lift? or can they actually drive, or are they still even able to drive? You may even have to take cost into account. Can people from low socioeconomic areas even afford the public transport that they are using? And this may affect the adherence to them coming to and from the clinic. Okay, A stands for activities. Now there's a lot of overlap between this question and what is about to follow. When I say activities, I mean, what are they doing on a daily basis that may not have to do with their work? Take me through your day. What type of activities do you engage in? This could involve picking up the kids from school, cooking, cleaning, gardening, and physical activity. Your duties outside of work. Furthermore, is there anything you're struggling to do now? What could you do that you now cannot do any longer? And optional, it may be very important to figure out what is their dominant side, right or left. As if they are experiencing any type of disability within their dominant side, this can affect their function quite severely. Okay, this ties into H, which stands for hobbies. Do they have any recreational hobbies, sport, or even religious commitments? This is very motivational for a patient, and it means a lot to them. Are we able to rehabilitate them back to the things that they enjoy? Even church, for example, are you able to get there? And is it difficult now for you to engage in the activities that are required? Even if it's things like standing or sitting for long periods of time. Now we're definitely going to delve into some physiotherapy focused questions. F stands for function. And this can definitely affect your objective assessment that should follow after your subjective assessment. This goes from high functioning to low functioning. 
Low functioning, for example, would be, are you able to roll over in bed? Are you able to go from lying down into bed to a seated position? Are you able to balance in a seated position? Are you able to go from sitting to a standing position? Can you balance in standing? Can you walk? And then furthermore, can you climb up a flight of stairs? You also need to ask if they require assistance doing any of these activities. Do they require walking aid doing any of these activities? This could involve things like walking sticks, crutches, walking frames, rollators, wheelchairs, anything that may affect a patient. And if they don't have it, then you can further look at prescription. High functioning activities may involve running. Can you squat? Can you jump? And all activities that are required for a higher level of function and even sport. Okay, this ties into A, which stands for ADLs. ADLs means activities of daily living. These are things that include eating, bathing, getting dressed, tying your shoes, buttoning your shirt, brushing your teeth or your hair, pouring juice or water, or even going to the toilet and accessing the toilet. All right, we have three more points. P stands for pain. For musculoskeletal conditions, you may have to delve more deeply into this topic as it could affect your hypothesis and your ability to create a diagnosis for the patient. This includes your pain scale, such as the visual analog scale or numerical scale, where you'll rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10. This also includes what we like to term SIN, which is severity, irritability, and nature. Aggravating and easing factors. What aggravates your pain and how long does it take to cool down? Is there anything you have found that eases your pain? Furthermore, what is the 24 hour history? Is it more painful in the morning, afternoon or evening? Did it disrupt your sleep? More importantly, is it postural related and does movement disrupt your sleep at night or does the pain wake you up from sleep as this could indicate a more sinister pathology? Then can you describe your pain? Is it a burning sensation, dull, aching, sharp, stiffness and you may even need to get the patient to write on a body chart or tell them where their pain is coming from specifically they can point is the pain deep or more superficial you can describe this as being closer to the skin or more deep within the body or the joints another thing to note is having to distinguish between a mechanical and inflammatory problem does the patient have pain while resting or does the patient's pain improve during activity or does the pain get worse during activity? F stands for feelings, and I use this as an umbrella term to establish your yellow flags. This has to do with attitudes, beliefs, culture, family beliefs, and more importantly, feelings. How are you coping with your disability? How is your family coping? How is your mental health? Are there any symptoms of depression? This could indicate further intervention or referral to a psychologist or social worker. This can also alter your rapport with the patient and how you interact with them and perhaps how mental factors may be affecting their condition. Lastly, E. Within my mnemonic, E is expectations and that stands for expectations. So, what are the expectations of the patient? How do they think their disability or their problem is going to progress? Do they think they're going to recover 100%? So you need to manage these adequately. Also, what are the expectations of their physiotherapy treatment? Or rather, what are the expectations? What do you think physiotherapy is going to be able to do for you? And that's it. We've almost covered everything. If you pan out, you will notice how all of these topics will slot perfectly within the RCA. So if you can summarize this within the first 15 minutes, you are addressing the bulk of the patient's problem allowing you to clinically reason your plan for your objective assessment and also your plan for treatment. This allows you to efficiently use both your time and the patient's time more optimally and you may potentially achieve more from a treatment session as a result. Furthermore, the use of outcome measures can be used in conjunction with the RCF with regards to each part of the puzzle. So that is it. If you are still with me, I hope you enjoyed the video and don't hesitate to subscribe if you did. Thank you for watching and goodbye.